Now Sweeney, Dwayne Sweeney! Sweeney's over! Can you please hand it over to your captain, Dwayne Sweeney? Welcome to Real Tales with Sweens. On this episode, I chat with Anton Leonard Brown. Anton is a professional rugby player who at the young age of 25 has already played 81 games for the Chiefs in Super Rugby and has 43 test matches to his name as an All Black and in my opinion is one of the best midfield backs in world rugby. We cover some great topics such as Anton's experiences with New Zealand Rugby's greatest high school rivalry, the famous first 15 clash that is Christchurch Boys High vs Christ College. We also discuss what it was like to caddy for Damian McKenzie in the New Zealand Golf Open, how much importance he places on developing his mental strength and well-being to enable him to perform at the highest level, his thoughts on Bitcoin as an investment, and we share our views on two of the world's best coaches, Wayne Smith and Warren Gatlin. Make sure you head to the website realtaleswithsweens.com for the show notes and follow the journey on Instagram at Real Tales with Sweens. Lastly, I want to thank Anton for sharing his tale with us, and I'm sure you will all enjoy this one. Thanks for listening. Cool. All right. So we're just sitting here. I'm just sitting here with uh, Anton Leonard Brown. So Anton Leonard Brown is All Black number 1153. Good to have you on, Anton. Thanks, Swains. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, just how, how we first met. So I was lucky enough to come back and be involved with the Chiefs in 2014 yeah. um, after I guess a little stint in Japan and I was in between seasons and, and came back and you're involved in that team um, as a well how old were you then 18? I was 18 years old. 18. Um, was that your first year out of school? That was no my second um, yep. so I was a year young at school um, so when I left I was 17 um, I was 17 for my first year out of school, then turned 18 that year. Uh, so, yeah, I was fairly lucky to start that young. Yeah, yeah. I think you, I think you beat me to it, though. You were 17 when you started, were you? Yeah, yeah, provincial yeah. rugby. Yeah. Mm. yeah, but you you leapfrogged provincial <laughs> rugby, and that's uh, that's something that we'll talk about as well. Um, but, yeah, I was lucky enough, and I suppose my first impressions of, of you, Anton, was just I couldn't get over how fit you were. Um, you know, I was at the time 29, I think, going on sort of 30. Um, and that, that Chiefs team was super fit. I came back, I think I'd spent six weeks drinking beers and barbecuing in, in my off season and wasn't in very good nick yeah. and, and came in and had to run a yo yo and that didn't go very well. Um, yeah, and then I had, to, I had to work pretty hard to get back in shape. But yeah, I just remember just this young, this young athletic. I didn't realise that you were only 18 at the time and, until somebody told me, and I was like, whoa, was he that young? Um, but, yeah, just I just remember you being everywhere when we played conditioning games and you never passed the ball because you are too fit. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, those were my sort of first impressions. And, actually, that's actually the only time I think we ever played together too, but I didn't actually, we actually sat on the bench together against the Crusaders in Hamilton. That's in right. 2014 mm-hmm. and you went on but I didn't play I said I, I rode the pine for yeah. 80 that was Letts' 100th yeah yeah mm. it was yeah yeah, yeah. so Tanido Latimer's 100th game but mm. that that I'm pretty sure that's the only time that me and you have actually suited up together because later through that year when I played I'm not sure oh we might have had a couple well, more. I, know, I think you're right later on in the year I went to 20s um, that's right so yeah I wasn't I think for the last quarter of the season I'd left for mm. New Zealand under 20 so yeah. I think that was the only game we got to play together well yeah. we didn't even play together no but, um, no no it was, it was pretty cool um yeah, I guess being such a young guy in that environment and at that time it was more of an older environment to what you have now mm. you have got a lot of young young boys now almost you have an environment where it's a lot younger uh, than older um but yeah, back then I remember you coming in and obviously as a kid I'd watch you watch you play to the get grades and it was pretty cool having you around and I actually felt a little bit sorry for you because like you said you've been barbecuing and drinking beers for the last six weeks probably coming to one of the fittest uh, super rugby sides in the comp and you know what friends and pies are like they love to get you fit so the first couple of weeks 
you sort of had to get on the line. But you did the mahi, yeah. um, and then you got out there. Yeah, yeah, no, I did. I remember that. Um, oh, that was probably the hardest four weeks of of my career. I think yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure I came in, and you guys went to South Africa. Yeah. Um, there was even talk that I might go to South Africa until they saw my first yoga, and then that was <laughs> terrible because, like, like I said, I hadn't been training. So, yeah, and I just yeah worked really hard for those three weeks while you boys were away, and yeah, managed to to get get into the twenty three, and then I think I played the following week. Yeah. And then I think I got a start when we played in Hamilton, and ended up probably. I think I started pretty much the rest of the games the rest of that mm. year on the wing of yeah. all the places as well. Never really had much speed, but I managed to to get a spot on the right hand yeah. right hand wing. There's actually a, I think I remember another game you played. It was in the Naki. Oh yeah. I was on the bench again. It might have been against was the, it Blues. the Blues. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you bumped off this guy, <laughs> and then you ran through, and then you drew him past. Oh, Timmy, back. and Timmy scored. Timmy eh? scored. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, yeah. I remember clearly. You know when you just remember things on yep. like just random things. Um, I remember thinking, "This old guy still got it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Far out. That's, yeah, yeah. that's going back six years too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but now it's cool. No, nah, it was cool. It was mm. a good. It was a good year. It was cool for me because I'd been involved with the Chiefs for a long time, and yeah. we and I'd been coached under Ian Foster the whole time, and then there was a whole new coaching staff training base had been moved um, yeah. obviously the team had been super successful and won back-to-back titles um and yeah it was cool to come back and and be involved in a team that was i suppose yeah just at such a high standard mm. yeah and I, I really enjoyed that challenge you've been a professional rugby player for well six years now and you're only 25 six, six seven. Years? seven seasons Seven, I think. Seven seasons. That's my seventh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. so, but you recently dabbled as a professional golf caddy. Do you want to <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about that? I did, I did. Um, that was sort of my PD, so yep. if you don't, what, don't know what PD is, it's like personal development, if you run out there, <laughs> um, you work on things for after footy. Um, so during the New Zealand Open, it worked in well. We had a bye week for the Chiefs, um, and my good mate Damien McKenzie asked me to caddy. And I thought, well, it's a perfect chance for me to um, dabble in something else. Um, and it went terrible. Um, but I I have to admit that I didn't have, I guess, the best talent on show. I mean, you, you're caddy, as a caddy, I reckon you're only as good as the player you're caddying. Um, I did my absolute best. I gave him great distances um, and, and, and everything, but he just wasn't firing. It was a little bit disappointing. Yeah, because yeah. Damien's quite a good golfer too, isn't he? He, he is a very good golfer. Um, he's one of those guys that's just naturally talented at everything, apart from, I think, basketball. He, oh, yeah. I can beat him in basketball, but yeah. literally tennis, table tennis, golf, anything he touches, he's good at. He's just yeah. one of those annoying guys. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like, he is a good golfer, but when the when it counted, um, he crumbled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so how did how did that come about? Did, did Damien just get invited to go down, or did he qualify? Or uh, Yeah, so they have ambassador roles. Um, so Bodie was heading down because he was on a sab- sabbatical. Yeah. Um, Dagger, Dagger does it most years because yep. he's retired, Yeah. and he's part-time, works with Sky part-time. Yeah. I reckon it's full-time. Yeah. And then there's other, there's other jobs playing golf. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so he was going down and then I think John Hart, who runs it, yeah, uh, he re- uh, heard that it's the Chiefs bye week and asked Damo to play on it um, as an ambassador and then Damo asked me to be his caddy. Awesome. It's like, sweet. And honestly, it's um, it's four days and people, so you can pay, it's like a pro-am, so like a professionals play with amateurs. Yep. So as an amateur, you get paired up with professionals, which Damo was, um, and it's one of like the best four days I've ever done. It's just set up so well. You play a game of golf, and on the 18th hole is a par three, and uh, right next to that's the players' lounge, and you go in there, grab a feed, get a, grab a beer, and you just sit there and watch all the rest of the golfers come in. Um, yeah, it's it's set up so well, and it's an unbelievable week. 
it's a pretty pretty amazing scene too where it's set, isn't it? Is it Millbrook in Mil- the Hills? Milbrook. Yeah, Millbrook in the Hills. So Millbrook run run it, and then the Hills they do the first two days. Yeah. So you'll play either the Hills and Millbrook. So you, on the first day you play, for example, you play Millbrook, yep. and then the next day you play the Hills. Or, or vice versa, and then the last two days at Millbrook. Oh, okay, so they host the weekend? Yeah, they ho- yeah. host the weekend because obviously Friday is the cut, um, so it goes down to less, less golf players. But yeah, it was it was so cool, and around that time of the year, the sun's shining, um, you're in the in between the mountains, it's just, yeah, you're, like, you're living the dream, really. Yeah. Mm. How did Damien go compared to Dagger and Bodie? Bodie had to get out of there, so he played the first two oh, days yeah. and had to, I think, go to like a Red Bull promo. Oh, yeah. Um, but Dagger made, I think, Saturday. Oh, yeah. And he, I think he ended up coming like 11th. So to make Sunday, you got to be in the top 10. Yeah. Um, Is that as an amateur? As an amateur. Yeah. So, but paired up with your pro. Oh, yeah. Um, so he did really well. But he said that the first, so he... The first year he did it, he was like real nervous, um, didn't go well at all. But mm. I guess through experience, the next yeah. year he was a lot better. Yeah. Mm. Is that his second time doing it? His second time. Oh yeah. yeah, cool. I did want to talk about Christchurch because you're originally from Christchurch, and everyone that I sort of spoke to that I said that I was going to get you on, yeah. um, that sort of talked about Christchurch, talked about how patriotic people are in Christchurch and I've got a few friends that have moved down there and even to the point like everything's about what what school you went to yeah. is is that true yeah 100 percent. yeah um you hold a lot of pride in what school you go to down there if I meet someone from Christchurch and vice versa I guarantee the first question will be what school did you go to? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what everyone said, which I find yeah, crazy. I guess it's just different for us yeah. up, up here in the Waikato. We don't really... It, it, it probably does come up in conversation, yeah. but it's not always the first question. Yeah, it's funny, eh? Like, and then... So you, you ask, like, what school did you go to? And then, like, you can sort of tell, like, oh, this, you're going to be like this. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, like, you know... <laughs> Like, yeah. oh, like say if I'm like from boys high someone yeah. be like oh like oh you're a boys high guy or like yeah code some, head. yeah code like head. someone be like from St. Bede's or you're a Bede and yeah. you're from Christ College yeah um, Shirley's a girl's name Shirley's a girl's name yeah. <laughs> yeah um but it is pretty cool in that fact that yeah. like there's just so much meaning um and, and pride from what school you go to and it's it's more against uh, amongst all the boys schools not so much amongst the the girls yeah. Like if you were ask if you ask girls that they don't really care, um, from yeah, what I've gathered, but amongst all the boys' schools and then some of the private co head, which are like there's Stack, who's a good rugby but well, yeah, co head rugby um school. Because 'Cause I've heard that people have said like business decisions get made off what school we went to is like, Oh, I'm not gonna deal with that bank because that bank manager went to a different school so it is obviously very patriotic i i wouldn't be surprised yeah yeah Yeah. so and then to stem from that christ college and christchurch boys is known as the the biggest rivalry in in high school first 15 rugby Mm. can you talk about your experiences with that um yeah oh it's it's pretty cool like so in year nine when i first went to the game I think it was at Christ College, and when it's played at Christ College, you get the afternoon off to go watch the game, and the whole school walks from Boys High to Christ, yeah. which is like a 20-minute walk. Um, you walk through Hagley Park and, and around the school, and you pretty much just like storm on in there, um, but you walk, <laughs> you know, like there's the whole school, Boys High is about 1,300 students, minus obviously the players playing, um, so you imagine... 1300 people walking yeah. 20 minutes down the road yeah. um, you storm on in there and at the time there was no breath testing oh, yeah. and it was a thing for the old boys to go so the old boys have they've all got their spots and they'll normally go like have a boozy lunch by the time they get there they're pretty drunk um, so like there's you, you got your school you got your old boys um, and then you just got the the history and, and pride behind it and, and in my first two years 
there was like massive scraps. So oh, it's like yeah. year nine and year ten, like huge, huge fights. Yeah. Um, and that's why they. In Did you my dominate year, the fights? Year eleven, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> personally, I, I stayed out of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like it was mainly between the the old boys. So like when the oh yeah on the like, sideline because yeah, you yeah. all got to walk out. They try to like keep you apart, but that you all got to walk out the same way, and then you just get the banter chucked at them, but. When there's obviously alcohol involved and mm-hmm. the tradition behind it, there's a few um, fists being chucked around. Yeah. But oh, that's when I, I first realised as a year nine what it meant yeah. and how cool it was. Um, and then when I got to play in it, I guess by the time I got to play in it, yeah. I knew what it, it this game meant. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it, was, it was such a cool event to be a part of. Yeah, yeah. So mm. from your year nine year, was there any guys in that team that really... I suppose kicked on from there that you looked up to. Um, it's a good question. I guess like when I was year nine and year ten, all the first was name players yeah. like I looked that, up like to. Your heroes, though. Yeah. Mm. Um, there was in my year nine year there was a guy called at, he was ten Nick Birchfield. Um, in my year ten year I can't remember who was at ten, but. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of players. I don't think too many have actually kicked on to like a higher level. But yeah. it's funny. I'll still see them around, and I still think they're pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, because yeah. it's like when I was year nine, year ten, like, I used to look up to you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got a lot of guys that I mm. I guess went through school looking up to, and, and yeah. I see them and bump into them around the place and. It's it's amazing how those feelings still linger. Yeah. So yeah, like I just yeah, there's some guys that I played, I watched play first fifteen in the traditional games, and yeah, just they are your heroes, and yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. Yeah, just a little, I did do a little bit of um, background on that game. So the first game was played in eighteen ninety two, so it dates back a fair way, and mm-hmm. there's been one hundred and thirty six games. Christchurch boys have won 84 and Christ College 43. But you would have played in that long reign that Christchurch boys went 16 years undefeated, was it? Yeah, I think it was yeah. 16 years. So I played in 2011, 2012. Okay. Um, and the, the, those were good years for us. Yeah. Um, it, I guess it almost got to a point where boys high were expected to win. Um, but still, the, the same feelings were there. Yeah. Um, but then Christ College over the last, I guess, four or five years, they're a lot, a lot better side, and the game, the game can go either way. They actually won it this year. Damon and I were sitting next to each other and went down to the wire. It's one yeah. point. Um, but yeah, it just I guess whether one one school has been dominating or or not, um, it's always a great game yeah, to, yeah. to go watch or be a part of. Yeah, cool. You and Damien, you just would have played together. Oh, played against each other, sorry, through yeah. that period as well? Because you guys are the same age, right? Yeah, well, the same age, but he was a year behind me. Oh, okay. Because so, you're a real intelligent age, yeah. so you got put up a year. Yeah, oh, I yeah. think he got put down a year. <laughs> 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 uh, nah, it's just how it worked out. So, yeah, yeah. We're, I'm five days older than him. Yep. Um, but we're at that sort of birth date where you can either be an old, yep. old for your year or you can be young for your year, yep. so... So you were young. Mm. Yeah. Did that sort of play a part in Damien coming up here? Because you would have come a year before him. Were you guys good friends before um, making the move to, nah, to the Waikato and the Chiefs? In all honesty, like we'd played, I think the first time we played together was under 15 Canterbury. And we only sort of seen each other through that. So we played under 15s, under 16s. And we had a connection. Like when we were there, we were mates. But outside of that, Yep. Would never hang out. Um, but yeah, I think we both made our decisions like without even talking to each other. Yep. And for both of us, uh, Re- Smithy and Renz were big factors in why we, we come up. But from memory, I'm pretty sure Waikato and the Chiefs had signed him, I think, before his year 13 year. Oh, okay. So yep. before his last year of school. Yep. Um, because, yeah, I guess I'd seen his future and in year 13 he had a massive year mm. um so 
Reans and Smithy, they're, they're pretty smart men. They yeah. did their due diligence yeah. and got him before anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, nice. No, that's cool. Yeah, because I did wonder whether, because I knew that you two were really close in age, I thought that it might have been something that you guys spoke about um, in terms yeah. of making your decision to come up and doing it together. Yeah. But obviously that friendship has, has grown yeah. um, since you've been up here and it led to you guys being locked down flatmates. How, yeah. how did that How did that go? Um, yeah, it was actually awesome. It was uh, great to to have someone there to train with and just to banter around with. And his cousin Maggie come down. Um, she's an accountant and she was in a small flat in Auckland, so it was easier to for her to come down to Damien's mansion. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so that's so, where you went to work, his house, yeah, not yours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and work in his um, second lounge <laughs> and have a nice comfy bed. So there was three of us and his dog Lou, um, so it was a good wee crew. Uh, we had, I think every Friday, we had like five o'clock drinks. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and had a few great nights. Um, but in, also in terms of training, like Damo had a gym, I've got a Watt bike, so we pretty much had all we needed and I guess at times we just bounced off each other for motivation because it's, yeah, when you're just training by yourself, it's a bit mm. of a slog and... Uh, when you got someone there, it helped out. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is hard. It's really hard to train too, and you don't know what the end game is as well. Yeah. Because we were all in limbo, mm. and then you boys with Super Rugby, no one knew what that was going to look like, yeah. when that was going to start, if it was going to start. So, yeah, I suppose having that support of someone else there in the same boat yeah. does make it a lot easier to sort of get through that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. No, that's cool. Um, Was there any... Any annoying habits that popped up <laughs> through you guys living together? Um, yeah, for sure. There's one, or there's something that he always did that would get on my nerves, but his way was always the right way. So oh, yeah. say if I was like cutting onions or something, he would come over and be like, no, nah, you cut it like this, or I'm folding the washing, now you fold the towels like this. <laughs> and it just got to the point, I was like, bro, like everyone does things differently, okay? Like, I don't have to do things your way. Just let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one. But he actually got to the point. So, like, whenever he would be about to say it, um, I'd be like, hey, bro, like, no, I'm going to do it my way. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so to be fair to him, um, he worked on that. Mm. And, um, yeah, he yeah. got over it. It's like any relationship. Yeah, yeah it's a, unless you're not, we're in a wee relationship yeah. and trying to make each other better. <laughs> yeah. Or... or trying to um understand each other's habits yeah. nice nice just with your move to the Waikato so you mentioned it a little bit there and you mentioned Renz and Smitty yeah um was that I know that it's I suppose heavily documented that Smitty came down and to see you and your family um yeah. what did that mean to you at, at that age to have someone like Wayne Smith approach you and I suppose lay out a, a pathway for you to be a professional rugby player. Yeah, it was pretty un- unbelievable. Um, you know, I was, I was shocked that someone of his caliber wanted to come and talk to me. And, you know, I had no idea what Smithy was like as a man. You know, I knew what he'd done as a coach, but I didn't realize that he's, you know, one of the great human beings as well. So to have him come to my house um, and talk to my family and myself was huge and I always remember one thing he did and that was he came to my house knocked on the door and he took his shoes off at the door and come in and my I'm from a a, I'm half Samoan half Kiwi and to take your shoes off before coming inside like from where I've grown up is huge Um, and you know, if he walked inside with his shoes, like, I would have thought nothing of it. I'd be like, you know, at all. Yeah. But for him to be, you know, humble enough to do that um, just shows the, the character of the man and it shows what s- sort of man he is. Like, he has been such a good coach, but he's such a humble and man and it just holds great values. Smitty's, you know, it's... it's heavily documented mm. as well like how good how good he is and how successful he's been as a coach but those morals they are just so yeah. they're so valuable and yeah. 
yeah, I remember in 2014, so that was the first time I'd been involved with Wayne Smith. I knew who he was, but um, that was the first time I'd ever been coached by him. And, well, no, sorry, that's a lie. He was actually a selector at New Zealand Colts trials that I went to in 2005, so it was nine years prior to that. Yeah. And we were out training, and something happened at training, and then he made a comment to me, and I sort of looked at him, and I was like, what? And then he came over and spoke to me, and he goes, I remember seeing you do that in, at New Zealand Colts trials in 2005. He goes, I remember, you know, it was something to do with my catch pass, yeah. and he gave me a positive comment on it. And he goes, I remember seeing that in this drill. And he knew the exact drill, yeah. and he said it, and it was like, I've got a pretty good memory. Yeah. And then once he said it, it put me straight back, like you mentioned earlier, like when you can just remember things vividly yeah. and I just as soon as he said it you know, he put me right back there nine years prior when we were at yeah. this Colts trial and I was just like I didn't even know that he knew my name prior to me mm. turning up in 2014 but he'd you know and it was the smallest thing it was one little drill that he yeah. ran but he remembered yeah. and that was um, you know that really took took me by surprise mm. and I think that's why he's been so, so successful because he has the ability to do that um, he works incredibly hard and I guess he knows his players, you know, he knows his stuff and to, he can connect with players on, on their level yeah. and for someone to do that of his calibre is pretty special. Yeah, yeah I was just, his attention to detail yeah. is like second to none and I think that's why he is so successful but yeah. you team that up with the ability to be able to relate to people like mm. he can from all walks of life and that respect and those strong morals, that's the recipe that you get, and that's Wayne Smith. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty special man. Um, one, one thing I did want to talk about while we're on rugby was your All Black debut. So there's pretty iconic moment, really, that, <laughs> that stemmed from that, and you letting your emotion out and showing your emotion after the hucker. If you haven't seen it, then... I don't know what you've been watching, but everyone <laughs> listening no doubt would have seen Anton, yeah. the image of Anton beating his chest after the hucker. Like, was that just, were you just fully in that moment right there and then? Um, yeah, I was, because I actually saw it the following week. Um, they, they slowed it all down. I was like, I don't even remember doing that. Yeah. Um, but it was just one of those, those moments. And for me, it all sunk in. That I was, I was now an All Black was when I finished that hucker. Yeah. You know, I honestly had to pinch. They say like it's a cliche, cliche <laughs> saying that you got to pinch yourself, but you literally do. And until I finished that hucker, I was like, wow, like this is actually about to happen. Mm. But at the same time, I was shitting my pants. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't come yeah. across that way. Your first touch, you set up a try. Well, yeah, I was, and I grew a lot of confidence from that. You yeah. know, sort of a good pass from Oe and yeah lucky enough it, it happened that way yeah like like I said before I actually didn't remember in that doing that it just happened yeah yeah mm. yeah so there because you got called in that week I was actually I got called in for two weeks and I was training as as like a replacement for Sunny and I was always going to be there for the first two weeks of the championship uh, until he come back and then I guess fortunate for me and unlucky for him, he did his Achilles, um, and that's how I got my opportunity. But I remember the... Oh, so he would have been at the Olympics. He was at the... Yeah. Was it the Olympics? He was at the Olympics, yeah, yeah. that's right. And yeah. he was coming back. And I actually remember the the f- first week, we're in Sydney, first Bledisloe, and so, I, I was, so even though I was in for Sunny, there's still a few more midfielders in front. And then I think that week at training, George Moala like, did his um, ACL. And then in the weekend, uh, Ryan Crotty got a head knock. So that's actually how I, I, through all these injuries, which is unfortunate for those players, I, I got my opportunity. But that week in Sydney, Lima Sopawanga and I, like we sort of connected straight away. And we're like, yeah, that's us. We're going to hold the bags this whole championship. Yeah, we're just stoked to be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're like, I guess it's mean. Like, I'm happy to hold a bag, you know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the next week I was playing, I was like, oh, no. Uh, I'm just supposed to be a bag holder. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was pretty cool. It happened that way. And the, the best thing about the All Blacks and what gave me confidence as players is that 
first of all, you just look around you. And I rem remember clearly my brother texted me that week and said, just look at the player to your left and right and look at how good they are. And then one thing they encourage you to do in the All Blacks is to just do your job. So I was like, well, all I need to do is do my job. And then I guess as rugby players, we've all got enough talent to let the rest um, sort itself out. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a real important message that I suppose for any aspiring professional rugby players is the higher the grade you go, yeah. actually sometimes the easier it is because you can just fully internally focus and mm. just do that, focus on your role, yeah. what you need to do in, in each sort of moment and then you're not worried about everything else that's going on and just trusting you. the higher the level goes, the more trust you have in who's around you and they're focusing on their job and that's the... That's where you end up getting that really good end product and those really good team performances. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, yeah, you, like you said, in the All Blacks, my job's probably more simpler than when you go down levels. Um, but I guess there's more writing on yeah. the job you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, but no, it's, it was such an awesome experience. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely some. Um, mm. Yeah, there's a hell of a lot of pressure that comes with wearing that jersey yeah. isn't there yeah so like I've worked on like the mental side of my game a lot through I guess being a part of the All Blacks because that's what's gonna in, in my opinion give me the the best outcome for my performance like obviously you gotta be physically fit but mentally you gotta process all those nerves all the negative I guess comments coming your way and I guess all the hype around what you're doing and being able to filter that all out and just do your job. Yeah. Because like you said, it, it's actually more simple, but it's how do you make that simple in your head? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because we spoke um, before we started the podcast and you talked about being a younger player and then sort of developing and becoming more experienced yeah. that being able to be consistent and... Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of yeah. what you mean by being consistent through your week? Yeah, because so when I first come into Super Rugby, and I don't, I guess I leapfrogged a few levels. I didn't play club or provincial, so I didn't. I missed a lot of like learning periods. Um, but the best thing it did for me was, first of all, like it put me in a, a pretty um, high pressure situ situation. Um, but I wouldn't change that, for, change that for the world. And what I did at the start of my professional career is, and I see it in a lot of young players coming through now, is that their emotions are attached to their performance. And I can see why that is, because you at school, you're, the, you're probably the best player, um, or one of the best players. Everyone's talking you up. You probably never had a bad game, you know, through high yeah. school. Um, so you actually don't know what it's like and then you get to a level where everyone's just as good as you, if not better, um, and the stakes are a lot higher. Um, and what happened was, so on my debut, for example, I had a pretty bad debut um, from my standards and I, I just got really down on myself um, and the next week I came off the bench, I played a lot better and I was like, um, I was a lot happier. But I went through a two year period where if I played well, I'd be a good person. And if I played bad, I'd be a, a bad person. Um, so if I played well, I'd have a great week the next week. I'd be walking around the environment like, hey boys, how you going? <laughs> <laughs> if I had a bad game, I'm head down, didn't want to talk to anyone. Oh man, like, why am I doing this? wouldn't say hi, like, hey bro, with my head down. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's how it rolled. And I went through an emotional roller coaster, and I reckon a lot of you know young athletes and young rugby players do that. But where I've got to now is that I, I'm a consistent person. So I'm competent like in who I am as a person. I'm confident that you know no matter what happens on the rugby field, I'm just going to be Anton. And obviously, if I have a bad game, I'll be disappointed. Um, and if I have a good game, I'll be proud. But that doesn't 
either either all doesn't change who I am across the week and that's what I mean about consistency is that no matter what happens in your performance you've got to be a consistent person um, and that probably, probably could relate f for everyone in life you know like you could have a bad week at work but that doesn't make you a bad person it's important that you work on yourself to be consistent across the board because my actually proudest thing to do is that we've had a pretty tough season with the Chiefs and it's been frustrating but after going 0-8, losing eight games in a row, you know, I walked around with my head held high, no different to what I felt before the season and that's that was the most important thing to me yep. and I'd like to think that if we won that thing and went 8-0, I'd feel the same, I wouldn't get get ahead of myself but I'd still be that consistent person. Yeah. Um, yeah, so hopefully I explained that well enough. Yeah, no, I yeah. think you nailed it there because mm. something that I spoke to when I spoke to Sammy on um, his podcast as well was yeah. about how being able to balance your emotions is so important because yeah. if you play on just emotion, it's actually really draining. Yeah. So if you're relying on emotion, um, you're relying on a on a big speech or a big moment or a big yeah. crowd to get you up. It's not consistent yeah. because you're going to have games where the weather's shit, people don't come, and then you don't have that <laughs> hype of the crowd. Well, there was you know talk of Super Rugby Aotearoa being no crowds at all the whole time. So if you're relying on a big moment and a big crowd to get you up, then you're not going to be consistent and you're not going to perform because that was a realistic option. Well, yeah. look at the Highlanders and the Hurricanes; mm. like they had to play without a crowd. So if you're in, uh, if you're motivated from an external point of view, yeah. in terms of a crowd being there or a really good surface you need to play on the yeah. best field, then that's not that's not sustainable because yeah. you're not going to have everything go your way all the yeah. time, and you are going to get haters and, but then with that you're going to get positive feedback as well. Mm. But it's how you channel that to be able to focus on, on what's important and what's not and how do I get back to simplifying it down in my mind to just do my job, whatever it is? Yeah, 100%. And I'm someone that is massive on like a process and, and trusting the process. So, you know, I, you could have no one there in the weekend or heaps of people and I always trust my process. So, you know, I get to the end of the week, I say I've done my work and now I've just got to play. And what I've actually worked on with um, our mental skills coach, Walshie, this year is about being going to the game and finding a neutral point. So he said, when you, and because just naturally, you know, you'll feel pumped up for some games more than others. Like yep. the adrenaline will be higher. Well, that's you know, human, the, 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 body, yeah, yeah, it's like, human nature. Yeah. So the bigger the occasion, um, I guess, the more pumped up you'll be. Um, and for reasons, for, you know, exter external reasons, you might be either down or you might be up. But he said, you've always got to find a, a neutral point because you can't go into a game expecting anything. You've actually just got to go into the game and being like so task focused. So say if I'm, I head to a game, I'm like, you know, I feel real good. And in my head, I'm, I'm going to make three breaks. I'm going to score three tries this game. And the first, first action I do is drop the ball. My expectation's up here, mm -hmm. and I've just done an action down there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean where you got to find a neutral point where I can be like, neutral, I could make a break, and I'd be like, sweet, next task. Or neutrally, I could drop the ball, sweet, next task. Um, rather than like being re really high on emotion or being really low, just trying to find that neutral point the whole time. Yeah, because mm. you see it a lot, like, um, and... Uh, I've sort of dabbled a little bit in coaching now as well. Yeah. And I coached the Waikato Women's Sevens team with Teresa. Yeah. And I always tell the girls, I'm like, I don't want to hear my bad. Like, if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. It yeah. doesn't matter. But I say that, but I do it. You know, I make a mistake. I'm like, oh, my bad, boys. Or I throw a pass that's, you know, that's not up to my yeah. own personal standard. I think it's not good enough. And I'll be like, oh, sorry, bro. Like, yeah. But there's no point in apologizing. You're not trying to do that intentionally. Yeah. It's just, but I suppose that's our internal, I suppose that external, sorry, um, expectation of what you think. It's that judgment, what yeah. you think other people are going to judge you on. And if you don't say sorry, they're like, oh, he doesn't care. 
but it's having a, a bit of understanding that everyone's yeah. trying to work in the same direction. People aren't trying to throw bad passes or drop the ball. It's just, it's going to happen sometimes. And yeah. it's just being able to next task focus. Mm. Yeah. And bro, I, I get caught out doing that as well. Like, I'll, I sometimes I'll say, oh, sorry, like, shit sorry boys yeah. but you're right like mm. that's actually not what, not what we're trying to achieve here it should yeah. be task by task and it's also about creating an creating understanding in the environment like how the, the mind works and, and what you're trying to achieve like mm. it's cool that as coaches you're encouraging that because then the whole team understands that you know and they understand mm. where you're trying to get to yeah because you know? I, I, um, one thing I did want to talk about and it's kind of segued into it now mm. was like Warren Gatlin came into my career at a really like probably at just like the perfect time. Yeah. I was twenty one. He came back um, and took over the Waikato job, and then he was yeah. there for my transition into Super Rugby when he was an assistant role there as well. But he just changed my whole mindset, like on on a number of different things. But one big thing was was that I was a perfectionist. Like I had everything had to be perfect, but to the point where I would, uh, I would intentionally stand too deep because I wanted to make sure that I could catch and pass. But by standing so deep, I wasn't fixing any defenders, mm. so I effectively wasn't actually doing my role because of fear of failure. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, "You need." He goes, "I don't care if you make mistakes. Like mm. you've got to push yourself because you've got the skill there, yeah. but you never push yourself into an uncomfortable position." Yeah. And it was because I was scared of failing, like, because yeah. I was just so, you know, I used to goal kick when I was younger as well, and I would just kick and kick and kick and kick, and if I wasn't kicking well, I'd just keep kicking until I yeah. kicked well, but that never worked, and I couldn't work out why. I was like, oh, surely the more I kick, the better I'm going to get, but it was because I was just so focused on the outcome rather than the yeah. process, so I was like, and that fear of failing, of failure, so once I put myself in those uncomfortable positions, he's like, cut your time right down, stand super flat and just catch it and pass it. I don't care what it looks like, don't care if it goes to ground, you just keep doing it and then eventually it'll become a habit and you'll be able to let those balls go under yeah. pressure. But if you're not willing to fail at training, you'll never ever try it in a game. You'll just carry or you'll pass way too early because you're just, you're not, you're not going to put yourself in a position where that risk of failure or success which in rugby is so small, I would never put myself into that position because I was too worried about the failing side yeah. rather than that. Um, have, have you noticed anything like that with him? Yeah, he's always trying to um, push the boys and I guess it sort of reflects in like his, his training, like we train with intensity and you know mistakes are okay. Um, but yeah, he's he's great like that and like with pulling you aside and, and giving you confidence to... I guess essentially express yourself because the the fear fear of failure gets in the way of who you can actually become as a, a player. Yeah. Um, so what you've just said there, like, is pretty inspirational for anyone, any, I guess any athlete listening, yeah. um, to to actually put yourself in that situation and overcome it. Because you said you're a perfectionist, and I reckon there's a lot of athletes out there who are. And it sort of gets you to that point because you're you're so I guess driven um, for what, what you're doing and you want to always get things right that you've put in all those hours and and you're a perfectionist about it. But when once you get to a certain level and it gets harder, um, you start worrying and that fear of failure comes into play. But it's pretty cool what Gats did for you there, um, and I'm sure from that you would have reaped rewards. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like I, um, you know, it's probably become, well, you know, what was probably the downfall of my game, being able to operate in really tight spaces mm. and being under pressure. Like because what would happen is I wouldn't let those passes yeah. go. I'd carry because you know the age old adage of don't pass the ball to someone in a worse position than you. Yeah. Because there was a lack of space, I thought that the next person was in a worse position than I was yeah. but they actually weren't because the pressure was just on me so it taught me to be able to and then now that's probably one of the strengths of my game or well, what it has been mm. for a long time is being able to get the ball away under pressure understanding you know that 
how much time I do need to catch and pass and understanding because especially as you get older you don't have the leg speed to be able to fix defenders so being able to manipulate them with standing flatter because you get that little bit closer they want to come at you and then you use that against them to be able to free up space on the outside so all that it just and it just came at the perfect time I was 20 yeah I think 21 22 at the time and sort of I'd I'd sort of been in and involved yeah. with Waikato from 17. This is my fourth, fifth season that I've played at that level, but I didn't even... Yeah. Like, I wore my blazer before I felt like I belonged in the jersey. Like, that, I played 18 games for Waikato, and it was only really then that I actually felt like I deserved to put it on. And it was like, that's quite sad to think, because it was in my fourth season. But that was just, you know, because I really lacked that ability to fail... Because I was just so worried about being perfect, but I was never going to be perfect, mm. and I I didn't know that. You know, yeah. I was just thinking, nah, I can, you know, because I I'd, I'd never been open, my eyes had never been open to the fact that failing was okay. Like yeah. you can make a mistake; it doesn't matter. Yeah. You just you learn from it and then you move on. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool to hear from. I guess someone like yourself and an older player, because that's something I talk about. You know, all the time I guess I've advocated for mental health, being on a lot of podcasts and where I'm, what I'm massive on as a player is just work on your mind yeah. because it's this, still the same things are happening. Mm. Um, I, some of the, the younger kids are a lot com- more confident coming through, but or they seem a lot more confident, but sometimes their confidence is trying to hide what they actually internally feeling inside mm. and like for me so we train you know we train in the gym three four times a week even in, like in pre-season like from i reckon the mental side of the game is more important than physical so if we're putting hours and hours and hours into our physical side of the game how how many hours are you putting into understanding your mental side because the fear fear of failure like perfection um worrying about what people think attaching your emotions to performances those are very real things for everyone mm-hmm. and the best players like that from what i've seen obviously you've got to have talent but into rugby there's these bucket loads of talent oh there's bucket loads there's, of club there, rugby yeah you know? bucket loads in, in club rugby yeah physically you got to be fit but i reckon but the that comes through opportunity yeah you through know? opportunity but yeah. i reckon the difference is mentally yeah how how do you mentally handle it Mm. and I, that's where I think we can make a lot of shifts in I guess in our rugby environments is to really hone in on what, what you do mentally and I know in the All Blacks um, you know the the mental skills aspect of everything is seen as like as, as important as your attack and defence so they also have a mental skills element and I reckon that's been one of the keys to their success is that that means like you're always talking about your mental game because at the end of the day you can train like Tarzan <laughs> you can be physically fit but you can go out there and play like Jane because mentally you can't handle it yeah and you see it all the time yeah I've I'd, I'd, I'd done that personally you said as a young player like you saw me training yeah in training man I was Tarzan running around fit as in the game I was so scared of failing I went into my shell yeah and I played like Jane, <laughs> and, and it, but it's so cool to go through that because mm. I've learned it and I've understood it now, and I worked on my mental side of the game, so I'm better for that experience. Yeah, and it's uh, it's so true what you say there is like we as rugby players, everything that's drummed into us from you know through my era when I started yeah. was just. It was all about how fast you were, what your skinnies yeah. were, um, you know, how fit you were, what's your Bronco time. Well, we didn't even have Broncos back then. It was beat test and then it became yo-yo, now it's Broncos. Yeah. But we, yeah, everything was sort of heavy, heavily weighted on that side. And it was, there was no, well, there wasn't as much focus on, on the mental side of it. And it was, it was, um, I've seen a lot of guys drop out of professional rugby or yeah. not quite make that next step and if they had the right tools then maybe they could have sorted the mental side out and dealt with a few more of those external pressures like mm. 
targets and bloody you know all that's part of it like yeah. i fully understand that but it's been able to simplify that in your mind to how important is that target like it's not going to consume your whole life yeah. but you need to make a shift here okay cool that's all right i've got that now i can make that shift i can get my i'm going to focus fully on getting yeah. my skinnies down but it's not going to consume me as a person as a player i've still got to focus on these other areas where if you just constantly going off that external pressure then that you're just going to bend and mold all the time and you don't have that neutral point because yeah. you're just chasing what people want externally mm. yeah what the you know the fans say on instagram yeah. what the commentator says about you what the coach wants from you as a target and if you're fully just chasing those and you've got no neutral point it's very easy to get lost oh 100 percent, and yeah. like that's where rugby needs to take take the next step you know you know, every player should be working on being consistent in who they am, or who they who they are, <laughs> who they am, who they are. It was that ex- that one less year of schooling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just it's such a cool thing to to talk about. Mm. Like I, I honestly reckon that if you spend a month on a player, say they're like they're at the same fitness base with a player just purely on his mental game and you and then another player he worked purely on his physical game I reckon you could almost that guy could almost through working on his mental game could be like would be more productive on the field yeah. because it's actually understanding like well that's experience isn't yeah, it yeah. like you see experienced players like I've been I've been through that in terms of being young and fit and keen and just training the house down and then now you know 35 36 nowhere near the physical player that i was but i'd argue that i was playing you know last couple of years for waikato is the best rugby i've ever played Mm. in the jersey and i way less fit and nowhere near as fast as what i used to be but through the mental side and i just gained that through experience and it wasn't you know i didn't spend a huge focus point on it but it was it just something that evolved naturally mm. and the right coaches and the right timing at the right time um, yeah. helped me develop that. But I think, yeah, 100%, you, yeah. you'd almost see that person that f- solely focused on the mental side of it probably play better yeah. than the one that was physically a machine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you can see I'm, I'm big on it and yeah. I hope to... I hope to see that shift. I actually had a great conversation with a assistant trainer um, this year in the gym, and we actually had our mental skills coach come in, and I guess we had some pretty honest conversations because obviously, I guess in the environment we were down on confidence, losing a lot of games in a row, um, and some good things come of that. But I said to our assistant trainer, he's like, oh. He's talking about high met, so we we get like measure, and he couldn't understand. Like in training, some players were running like awesome, like the high mets were really high, but in the game they were like they were lacking, and and I said, well, I reckon that's because like you can actually be really physically fit, but in the, in the game there's a lot of other like mental aspects going on. So I remember I used to do this. So if I wouldn't when I was like so scared of making mistakes what I'd do to not make them as those mistakes was not try as hard mm. so not put yourself yeah in that not, position. not put yourself in that position yeah um and I said like with your trainers they need to team up with the mental skills side of yeah. things as well because look like I said before you can be Tarzan physically mm. but you got to be Tarzan in, in the mind as well yeah you got to play with that freedom and their ability not to play with fear. Yeah. Because I see that a lot. Like, mate, you're, you're being such a good trainer. You're one of the fittest guys. But get on the field. Mm. Everything's going through your mind. But they're, they're scared of making mistakes. So they're like, oh, I, I won't run to make that tackle. Yeah. Because I might miss it. You yeah. know? I'm not going to run everywhere. Because mm. I just want to be in a safe position. Yeah. In a safe place where look, I can do my job confidently. And not get told off in the reviews um but where my mindset now is is like all i focus on is is working hard 
and and being physical. So, and those those are things I can measure because running as hard as I can doesn't take talent. No, it actually takes your your heart and your mind. Yeah. That's something I can measure myself on. So as long as I'm running some of the high, highest high mets in the team each game, I'm happy. And as long as I'm trying to tackle as hard as I can or try to run as hard as I can, those are things I can measure. And then all all the skill set based. Like obviously, I'll be disappointed if I make mistakes, but that's what I work on during the week. You can well, you know, how you worded that is like perfect because you you can see like that mental side of it, how it comes in. Like I can think of a number of players I have played with over the years. Yeah. If they're really good defensively, like a really good tackler, they will work their ass off on defense. Like they will be everywhere. Yeah. But I guarantee the those guys that are super like really good defenders, but don't have the skillful attributes to be able to ball play and a little bit more lacking on that side of it, you'll see their high mets. And when we say high mets, high mets is a, it's a, a way speed. To, yeah, a way, to, speed a way to of, measure. So you get one high met for running over a certain speed yeah. so um, it's like, for a certain distance. Yeah. So Basically how hard you yeah, work. Yeah, so yeah. It's, yeah, it's not mean, it doesn't mean you're sprinting, yeah. but it means you're like more than a jog yeah, type yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you'll you see it, like mm. they, their high meets will be through the roof when the opposition's got the ball, yeah. but when you have the ball, they, they're not because, yeah. and you see the other side of that, the guys that aren't as good defenders, they'll work a lot harder when they we have the ball because that's where yeah. the attributes lie. So, and the, and a team needs that, that's, yeah. a, that's part of a balance. And that comes, and it, but it also comes through confidence. Yeah. You have to be confident in what you're doing to be able to run fast. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're you're not playing in the moment. You're looking at where you need to go next instead of just going there. So you come out of that scrum and it's like, all right, I need to go around the corner. Yeah. If you're in tune with what you're doing and your mental space is good, mm. you'll just come out of there and you'll go. Yeah. If you're not, you'll see. Uh, a little bit of yeah, hesitation exactly. do I go same yeah. way here or do I stay yeah. and then that's uh, so it's yeah. not just the mental side but it's also that preparation side yeah. which you talked about and getting yeah. getting a week right and preparing to be able to turn up on the weekend or yeah. whatever night you, day you play and just go boom yeah. turn it on and go yeah. yeah and I know a game's 80 minutes but it also comes down to split seconds. So you hesitating for split seconds it yeah. can be the difference. Yeah. You know between like you going through a gap and a, and not. So yeah, it's it's a space I'd love to see just people hone in on. And I think some teams are, but yeah. You know, I'd I'd love to see more of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, you know, I'm I'm really excited about you know I've I've been I I don't listen to sort of too much media when it comes to yeah. rugby. Um. And just things that you know people say on social media and stuff like that. It's always sort of pay attention and have a little bit of a look, yeah. but it's not something that I'm you know really focused on because it goes either way. Yeah. You know that's an external factor. It's going to be positive. It's going to be negative, you, and and it's all dependent on results. Yeah. But they don't see the day to day and the little bits and pieces that go on behind the scenes. That mental side of it, the preparation, and I know that there's been a heap of hate coming towards you boys yeah. with the results that you've had but I know Warren Gatland as well so yeah. it excites me yeah. I know Roger Randall who's yeah. the attack coach and that excites me because I know what they're like I know what they did for me personally and I know what they did you know I, d- I just think back to when Warren come and took over Waikato in 2005 we were terrible because we were adjusting to a new system new way we trained everything was different the next year we won the title. Yeah. So it was it was that quick to turn around. I'm not saying that you guys will win next year, but I know because I trust yeah. and this is just my opinion, mm. like other people have different opinions, but I trust what his process, what he does, who he is as a person, who he is as a coach. Both those men, like you know, Roger as well, mm. um, I know that I'm pretty excited to see what the Chiefs are gonna do in the future. Yeah, yeah I'm excited too. Yeah. Like we've we literally hit rock bottom we had a very honest review and a lot of good things are going to come from this. Um, yep. You know, in a way, we we weren't too far off, you know, in, in most of the games, but it wasn't good enough. But, yeah, I, I know we're at rock bottom right now, but yep. I can see something, you know, something pretty cool is going to happen out of this. Yeah, well, yeah. If, you, if you look at it too, like it's not a super experienced side either, yep. is it? Like, you know, a lot of the... 
you know, there's a, you know, I suppose a lot of the experienced boys have sort of mo- have moved on and there's a bit of new blood. I suppose some of the guys that are have been in the environment for, you know, five, six, four, five, six seasons mm. haven't been big minute players either. Yeah. So they haven't had, you know, with that week in, week out, yeah. you know, time time in the saddle, um, they've been involved and they've trained a lot, but it's progressing that into time on the field and, mm. and people getting comfortable with that. So it's it's pretty exciting. There's a shitload of talent there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think everyone can see that and maybe that's why the frustration's there because they can see how talented the team is but it's not quite coming across in results. But Yeah. Like, like I don't, I'll never make excuses for this year. Like, we should have done a lot better. Um, but at the same time, like you just said, there's a lot of young players and inexperienced players that are going to be better for it. So I reckon going forward, we're in a pretty good space. Yeah, well, if you've got, um, you know, someone, well, now you, you're a leader of the team at the young age of 25, but just listening to this conversation around that mental headspace and mm. being in and putting yourself in a, you know, training the mind and like I've, we spoke before we got on the podcast too and talking about other players and, yeah. and coming in and learning that neutral and finding that consistency mm. like we've got people like you leading and being a leader in the group and your mindset's like that that's only going to bode for for things to turn around and things to to be successful yeah. so I'm, I'm super excited to see see where that goes <laughs> thanks bro <laughs> let's hope so nice um cool we'll uh we'll go off rugby a little bit uh so i fired it out on social media to (laughs) to get some talking Mm. points and some hot topics um and some interesting ones came back of a mutual friend friend of the show and he he had he had a long list and we'll we'll dabble into a few of them (laughs) um since we started off with golf, we'll start off. He's got your thoughts on not handing in golf scorecards. Where's that stem from? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm an honest golfer, so I hand in my golf cards. and I'm a 17 handicapper, and I think every time I've played with him, I've just had one of those days where, I guess as a 17 handicapper, like I can either score 100 or I can score like, mid 80s so I can either have a shocking day or, or a great day <laughs> um, so I think that's the point he's trying to get to he's so you've to got say, the consistency side of rugby sort of but you're still yeah, working on the golf part mate <laughs> golf's a whole other level man <laughs> golf is insane you know even I could I reckon I could meditate about golf for an hour before I go play and I still don't know if it would work that out <laughs> man I don't know how those professional golfers do that man a lot yeah. of respect for what they do um yeah. Well, you've been inside yeah. the ropes now, eh? Yeah. You've been a caddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think he's trying to allude to them. I'm a burglar. Oh. Um, but he's actually he's actually the opposite. So he's got a really low handicap, but never plays to it. Oh, yeah. So he so only hands his good ones. Only in hands in his good ones. Yeah. Which, so he wants um, the status of a low handicap. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know what's worse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't You guys decide yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah, we'll leave that to the listeners. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. He's... So obviously, been you've been a professional rugby player since a young age and been involved with the All Blacks for a number of years now. So with that, would have come a bit of money in terms of like investments. He's got a couple of things down here. So your thoughts on Bitcoin and then also investing in race horses. So do, you, I'll let you go in what direction you want to. Um, yeah, we'll start with the uh, the race horses. Um, I like to call it a hobby. Hobby. But uh, I've actually well, been... Well, hobbies, yeah, that's probably a better term, mate. Yeah, it's, you, you don't need it's not the, an investment. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't need the return. <laughs> I do. I need every thing <laughs> I can get. <laughs> but um, so KK, Kieran Kane coached us, I think it was from 2.16 to 2.18. And he got me he got me hooked. So after my first year all back, he's like, I'll oh, buy into this horse. <laughs> 10% share. I was like, had a bit of money lying there. I was like, oh, awesome idea. Um and it ate grass for for a year. It was like just come out of the yearling sales, and then it started racing. And it won, won like its first four out of five races, and it it won five out of seven or something. It won on Cup Day, Addington uh, Cup Day, not the big race, but like in a as a three year old. And at the time, it was the horse was called Dorchester, and he was the best three year old rolling around. And I was like, man, this is awesome. So we're doing really well. Um, 
and then the next year I was supposed to like have this big campaign where I was racing for a lot of money um, and that's when I was about to bank um, but unfortunately I had this race and had a soft pellet tissue issue so when I was racing it couldn't breathe properly oh yeah so the pellets just uh, the thing above your tongue yeah um, I think it was like hanging down so to get minor surgery and look I don't know what happened but it ruptured its bowel and had to be put down unfortunately um, and my, my trainer was devastated because like, people actually say that horse racing's like they're rough with their horses but mm. those trainers look after them like kids like they love their horses um, and also this thing was pretty, the Dorchester was a bloody good horse as well um, so we got paid on insurance and so what I did with the insurance I was like well buy two more shares yeah. so I put two more shares into horses <laughs> and that's how and it's just continued from there um, shout out to Mitchell Kerr down in Christchurch he's one of the great um, harness trainers coming through and he's doing an awesome job so yeah. as, as a hobby I've actually done well because I'm probably sitting at about even to even profitable um, from what I've done so far but yeah I think you've always got to look at horse racing as a hobby uh, yeah. not as an investment because yeah. it's a pretty frickle industry yeah yeah well you obviously um, had the dream horse and then had yeah the yeah yeah. Mm. yeah unless like you pick up a Winx well, yeah. you know that, that'd be nice um, that would be nice that'd be very nice <laughs> <laughs> that's I think it's once in a generation type thing yeah um, and then on Bitcoin it was actually Damien encouraged me but his I think his cousin was doing some research on Ripple yeah um, XRP and this was four oh it was about three years ago and at the time like, it was booming so I bought into this Ripple not not heaps um and then it ended up like now it's gone. So like, I think I'm down eighty percent on my investment. But <laughs> but I'm just gonna leave it in there. Yeah. Like, I don't care if it like because it wasn't a lot. So I don't care if it all goes. But I'm just hoping that one day it just goes skyrockets. Turns back around. Um. But yeah. Also on Bitcoin, we have a, a mate called George Worker, and he's big on it. And he told me during lockdown when um that buying to Bitcoin, I think it was like eight grand. It's gonna go up to twenty, thirty grand. And it went in one ear out the other, yeah. and it hasn't hasn't gone anywhere. Hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> so don't listen to George Worker for uh, any yeah. uh, cryptocurrency investment <laughs> to all the listeners. Sweet. So <laughs> just on that, um, he's got another one down here about George. So yeah. can you just explain who George is, and then he wants to know your thoughts on his skinnies. Yeah. So George Worker, um, he's a great man. He's been a black cap. Um, and he's sort of been in and out of the squad for a long time. He's a batsman, opening batsman, left-hander. He's a great, really talented batsman. Um, but almost, the, I guess, that story about that really talented kid um, who loves a beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so nah, he's like Jesse Ryder. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's, he's Jesse Ryder. I think he's got the same skinnies as Jesse Ryder as well. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna hate me for this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's over lockdown. He's he's blown out a bit. Um, but that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's all I'll say. That's all you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Nice. He's got, so R and V's been a been pretty high on your list um, <laughs> of things to do in the off season. Yeah. And he was wants... Ant the only um, person? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there was a few. Out. The other ones were kind of the other ones were kind of oh, yeah, off yeah. in the rugby questions. Um, <laughs> But he he said R and V day four versus day three. Why is day four better? Day four versus day three. Um, does it say day one or day? No, day, day four. four and three. Why is day four better than day three? Well, day four is you head home. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's going on about there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But day three was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, Dave Dolan played, and I think. I think on the last day they got about twenty five thousand people. Yeah. Um, because heaps of the local locals from Gizzy come in as well, and the sun was setting. You got Dave Dobbin playing, and like we we're on like the hill, and you just everyone's just seen to tunes like it, all every Kiwi knows Dave yeah. Dobbin songs. Honestly, it was so good. Um, 
obviously we we had a we're a few deep, so we're yeah. singing along. Um, You're a real good singer, though, eh? So <laughs> you would have been carrying yeah. the voice. Don't get me to sing. I'm a terrible <laughs> singer. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just one of the great days, and I guess I got to work here and Ant were there and heats of the boys. So yeah, it's just great times. Talk a little bit about that too now, just probably as we sort of wrap it up. But you. Do you have a good balance of friends outside of rugby? Because I know for me, mm. like that was real important when I first started out my career. All my friends were just rugby players. Well, you know, I had friends outside, but I kind of neglected them a little bit mm. and probably spent too much time with just rag- just the rugby boys and the guys I was playing with, and and that kind of I suppose almost fed that um, worrying about the outside judgment and all that sort of thing because I was just focused purely on rugby. Yeah. Yeah, do you have a good balance of friends outside that you've tried to stay in touch with? Yep. Yeah, I've... So a couple of my... Well, it's about three or four of us from school. Um, we're actually in all different parts of the world, but we've got a chat and we catch up all the time on there. So yeah, I try and make an effort to, to sort of connect with them. And I guess when we get back together as a group, and that might happen once every year, once every two years, it's like nothing's changed you know when you just got those mates that you know you, you could not see them for literally a couple of years but it, it never changed um mm. so I've definitely got that that group of mates and I guess we make an effort to connect through social media but I guess we can't in person mm. um and then I've got like good mates like worker and and aunt um who, who's pretty <laughs> they're, they're characters um yeah. you know AJ and, and stuff like that but it, it's great to connect with them as well um and in and in hamilton it's a great question in hamilton it's it's mainly the rugby boys yeah um well it's very time consuming yeah being yeah a professional yeah rugby player, especially at the highest level like you yeah. don't get a lot of time to yeah to i suppose spend with the people that you're uh, you know anyone that's not in the team because it's quite consuming when you yeah when you're into it yeah, um, but yeah, it's mainly the rugby boys in, in Hamilton, and like you said, it is very time consuming. But one thing I, I've worked on is just having a group of friends and family that like you trust, um, or their opinions that you trust, and um, like having that that circle really tight. And the be- the most important thing is all my good mates outside of rugby. They understand, I guess, what it's like, um, and they'll they'll never bring up sort of rugby things. I'll never be judgmental or anything. But they they're really people that's got my back and, and I yeah. can trust. And that's that's why to me, like, no other opinions matter yeah. because I've got good mates, I've got good family, and unless they want to give me criticism or, yeah. or constructive feedback <laughs> and like, I'll take it like, yeah. I'll take it on the chin then like why worry about anyone else yeah you know keep a keep a tight circle um and just yeah just worry about what they've got to say because no one else really does because in the society we live in today you got social media platforms you got a society that that wants to hear bad news not good yeah. news all the time and I guess if you buy into that, um, it can be pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, I suppose having that balance of those those people that you can trust around. Yeah. You spoke about it earlier, having your neutral point in terms of your game. Mm. They're your neutral point for life, aren't they? 100%. Yeah, they yeah. come back. They're consistent in who they are and who what your relationship is to them. It's not reliant on you being successful. It's not reliant on yeah. you not being as successful because there is some relationships like that where yeah. people won't spend time with people that are more successful than them because they, they're they just, you know, they're just wired that way. They want to be the most successful person in the room. Yeah. And, and I think it's when you can find that group, you can find, and some people's groups like that will be really big. Some will be really small. Mm. But if you can find that neutral group where you can just be you, yeah. it's, um, you know, it's, it goes such a long way to being happy in life. And in, 100%. Yeah. Mm. No, that's cool. I think we'll uh, finish it on there, Anton. Any awesome. final thoughts from you? Nah, no. thanks for having me on. It's been pretty like awesome chats, and you can probably see I'm pretty passionate about, especially the mental side of the game. Um, so I guess to all the listeners, hopefully you got a few things from that, and 
I'm always trying to work on myself um, as a person and I guess my game mentally. So I've done a few podcasts now, but it's funny. I always think about what I've said. I'll probably go back and listen yep. to this and be like, and then that will be like my knowledge base now. But then in the next six months, I'll learn a lot of new things. And I might say something a little yeah. bit different. Um, but yeah, no, nah, thanks for listening. And thanks for having me on. Nah, awesome, Anton. Thank you very much, mate. Cheers, brother. Cheers, brother. I mean. <laughs>